Good morning, Clive, and thanks very much for giving some of your time to talk to the Mint today. Good morning, thanks for inviting me. I was just wanting to talk really about where things are at with the economics of biodiversity and land and so on, particularly in the light of the Das Gupta report, which you provide an excellent commentary on as to how really it's the same as the 90s, goes back to the sort of Pierce days of environmental economics and valuation. I mean, why has there been no progress really in this area over 30, 40 years? Yeah, I think there's, there has been quite a lot of changes. I mean, the Descripta review is interesting in that it's an attempt to actually go backwards. And why is it, why is the Descripta review actually being pushed by the government, by the Treasury Department and so on? And you see this uh, repeatedly, we've seen it with the Stern review as well. Whenever there is a rise in concern and the crisis gets worse, then you get a mainstream reaction. Descripta is nothing new, of course, because it's basically just trying to revive the same old solutions that have failed at time and time again, cost benefit analysis, uh, making things trade-offs. And the, the, the changes that have occurred though are actually the increasing financialization of nature and the, the massive markets that are being set up. This is a big change over the last 40 years. So you know, when Pierce, David Pierce was around 40 years ago, it was all about advising government departments and trying to get valuation on. Valuation is no longer the issue. The Descripta review is pathetic on valuation. Uh, Descript has never done any valuation himself. He's not a cost benefit person. He's a, a theoretical optimization neoclassical economist. And this is evident in the review. If you look at the coverage of the review, the chapter on biodiversity itself is about three and a half percent of the entire review. So you have 600 pages and you have this very small section on biodiversity of which there are only a few pages on valuation. And yet this is central to his entire theoretical approach. His entire approach is about accounting prices and that he is going to value biodiversity, but he doesn't tell you how he's going to do it because it can't be done. You know, I spent 20 years working on valuation. I have a, a book on cost benefit and uh, analysis and the environment. And I can tell you it's totally theoretically uh, unfounded what he's suggesting. It can't be done in theory and it can't be done in practice for sure. So what's the point of all this? The point of all this is if you look at who is fating Das Gupta, who is inviting him, who is having him speak, it's the financial banking sector. So the big change is that the finance and banking boys have all come on board and they've come on board because they want to set up new markets. So we're talking about everything from carbon trading through to biodiversity offsets. And this is the new area, right? This is the new thing. You don't need valuation anymore. What you need is markets, new institutions. That's what the Descripta review is all about. But, it's but really irrelevant. But I no, I, I totally get that. But but he doesn't. I mean, as far as I could see, and obviously I haven't read all six hundred pages. He doesn't talk a lot about markets, does he? I mean, he doesn't need to. You see, it's the it's the classic uh, neoclassical economist approach. You set up all the problems that everybody else has talked about. And you seem to be taking them very seriously. You talk about future generations, you talk about environmental crisis, you talk about social inequity, you talk about uncertainty and ignorance. And then what you do is you squeeze it all into this little box of neoclassical thinking where everything is redefined. So uh, uncertainty and ignorance becomes risk and risk is a risk assessment and risk assessment can be done by financial managers. Right? You talk about values and all these different values that you can have, and you seem to be extremely concerned about ethics and other people. And then what do you do is you squeeze it all down to monetary valuation. So everything is now monetary value, which can be handled by what? Financials, banking sector. You talk about all the different problems with markets and prices, and then you talk about how some miraculous, benevolent, enlightened person, actually is a woman, you know, very enlightened of Descriptor, he always uses a woman in this uh, context now, uh, so we have this female dictator who's going to tell us what all the prices in the economy will be. You know, they're going to be calculated miraculously somehow, but it's all then squeezed down. All the values are squeezed down. So what so, you're doing is you're framing everything in terms of capitalism and markets. That's what you're doing. It's a framing exercise to say, look, all those problems that people are talking about can all be squeezed into this little box. 
you don't have to talk about what you're going to do. The policy approach is uh, is already uh, you know being set up. But I suppose <clears throat> taking his logic at least, and the fact that these markets are growing, um, presumably he he would accept and the, that they need this female, you know, they uh, civil what's it to create all the the. the the right prices for the capital markets to work. Yeah, so this is the tricky business in this, isn't it? Because when you see what's going on, you know, neoclassical economics, if you go back to things like the socialist calculation debate in the 20s and 30s, it had a central planner. So the lie of the whole thing is that there is a central planner who is determining the prices. Now, who sets up all those shadow prices? Who calculates all those shadow prices? Well, this is done by a centralized bureaucracy. But the lie here is that apparently the markets are going to do this once the prices have been adjusted. So you've got a total contradiction between the central planning system that is meant to come up with the prices and the free market, which is supposed to allocate resources efficiently. Well, if you've centrally planned all the prices, you don't have a free market. <laughs> and this is the lie of the whole thing. So why do the, the, the finance sector just think, oh, well, that's a good cover? I mean, it's all nonsense, isn't it? I mean, to a it is all nonsense, yes. But the finance sector, they don't care about this because what this does is it creates a screen, right? So here you have this person who is now, you know, a, a Cambridge economist who's highly rated, just like Stern was put up there on a pedestal. And they say, ah, this is the enlightened approach of e economics to the environment and capitalism can do uh, what it normally does and it can run efficiently. That's the whole story. And then what you have is the real thing is the real economy with the power brokers and the bankers and the financiers who are just going to do what they're doing anyway, which has no relationship at all to what Daskrips is talking about. There is no social accounting prices. There is no uh, intervention by a central planner. What there are is markets set up and run for trading to just make money, right? And that's what's going on. So issuing new financial instruments, but even more than that, what you have to do to get a market to operate, right, is you need government support. So you've got to have the government and the institutions of government to back your markets. And how do you get trading on offsets? You could, people won't do offsets unless it's regulated. Yeah. What you're trying to do is remove the planning restrictions and put in markets that allow trade-offs. So if we take, you know, this urban sprawl, for example, urban sprawl regulated, stopped, you set up a green belt. Ah, no, we can reverse this now, because what we can do now is you can build anywhere as long as you offset it. But that requires government to be on board to change the regulations. So this is about a game of getting the power changed from, the, from away from the planning system, actually, and into the hands of the market system so that you can start building and constructing and doing whatever you want. And you, you can destroy the entire of Oxfordshire's countryside and offset it by recreating something in the Amazon, right? Build, you know, go and fund some Amazon forest. And it's a, it's a lot more biodiverse than that Oxford countryside, so get rid of it. It's obviously a good trade-off, and then you get a net benefit, right? Because now we've got more biodiversity because we've recreated some part of the Amazon that we destroyed earlier anyway, right? Now, it has to be said that the net biodiversity gain has to be in the UK, so... <laughs> yeah, okay, it, it may be, but it, this, is, this is what they're pushing for, is international trading, right? So if you look at the carbon markets, they start nationally, they, they maybe even start regionally, and then it becomes more and more relaxed as the market grows and gets bigger, and they say, oh, well, it's not very efficient just to restrict it to the UK. Let's do it you know, broader and broader and get more and more people on board. So even if you do the UK, of course, it's still highly problematic because people with their local environment will lose it, right? So you will lose Oxfordshire countryside, or you lose the green belt around London, you have the M25, blah, 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 and so on and so forth, and you build on it. And then you say, oh, well, we're going to do something in the north of England. Well, great. So everybody in South England can lose their environment and they'll have to go to the north of England to get it, or you, you know, so on and so forth. Right? And why do you think the environmental NGOs have been, or some of them, or the WWF, RSPB, as you point out, uh, David, the sainted, David Attenborough, uh, um, you know, they have been supportive seemingly. What's going on there? So, I mean, David Attenborough is an extremely naive person, I would say. Uh, I would say that, you know, if you look at his wildlife programs, there's never a human in them. You go through, you know, 30 years of wildlife programs, where is the social aspect? 
I mean, the man is talking about animals all the time, but he never talks about humans and human interaction. So he has absolutely no understanding of the economy or the interactions between the economic and social systems and the environment. You know, it's basically back to a Jacques Cousteau type of uh, approach to conservation back in the 50s and 60s. Great for raising public awareness about wildlife and the beauty of nature, but absolutely useless in interesting the social ecological crisis that we're facing. So what's he done? He, he's jumping on board on the bandwagon. I mean, I don't know where he stands politically. You know, quite often it's interesting to look at it, but presumably he's extremely conservative. And therefore, he also wants to maintain the current system, the economic system, you know, the way that it is with the structure it has, without looking at actually the, the, the chain and supply chain issues and the, and the other aspects. The environmental movement more generally, right, if you look at what's going on there, is there's been a complete neoliberalization of the environmental movement. It's happened from two perspectives. One is because neoliberalism, the rise of neoliberalism over the last 30 years has become very dominant. And therefore, everybody talks about markets and market values. And then to get a seat at the table, this is what you're regarded as having to do. The other side of this, though, is actually extremely strategic from the corporations. So the corporations started actually setting up uh, shadow NGOs and also funding NGOs and infiltrating the existing NGOs, especially the big ones. So what you see is if you look at conservation organizations, you know, there's studies on this and I've done a bit of work on this myself. You look at the boards of the, of the big NGOs, especially in America, and you'll find that there are corporate executives on the boards. 60 or 80% quite often of the boards is actually from the corporate world, from banking and finance and from the big corporations. And you see this takeover effectively of these NGOs. So the NGO movement, the environmental movement at the big level has been taken over. It's what I call new environmental pragmatism. So people then think that, oh, we have to be part of this, right? We have to cooperate with the big corporations, with the mining companies, with the resource extractors, with the oil industry and so on, the ones who are actually you know, destroying the environment. Uh, and, they, and they're the ones that you then sit at the table with because you want to be at table with the powerful players in the, in the society so you don't challenge them. So it, it's clearly been a, a, something that has happened over the last 20 years very strongly. And it's been operative. You can see it in the Paris Agreement. The corporations sit at the table. The NGOs are not at the table. The corporations are the ones who are pushing the policy through. The corporations are the ones who fund uh, the NGOs. So the NGOs now are getting funding from them to do projects which are corporate friendly. The offset markets are uh, being, uh, they use the conservation organizations, you know, they have land. So you can improve the land, they fund the improvement of land so they can do offsets elsewhere. So you see this very much, I mean, the Nature Conservancy uh, in, the, in the US is very big on this and they really pushed a, a, what they were calling a new conservation, which was basically just old fashioned uh, development and, uh, and offsetting. Uh, uh, and this is very clear uh, across the conservation movement. But then you've also got things like the ecologists, right? So what, you know, I'm an ecological economist, so I've worked with ecologists a lot, and a lot of ecologists bought into this idea that we can price nature and that this in a capitalist system will save nature. Yes. <clears throat> so just going back to one thing you said just early on, <clears throat> you said that the Das Gupta report was a sort of pushback. <clears throat> um, so to look on the positive side, I suppose, if there were a set of people who thought it was worthwhile putting quite a lot of resources and effort into the, the sort of pushback, if you like, what are they pushing back against? And what's the positive side for you? What, what are the sort of emerging positive trends? Uh, that... so people have become more radicalized, right? So what you've seen, if we take like the, before the 2008 crash, talking about capitalism was just not on the agenda. You know, people were talking like this, uh, these populist things about the end of history, you know, socialism has gone, the, the alternative things have gone and so on. Since 2008, it's been very slow. So you get the, the crisis in 2008 and you get this opening up of criticism of, of, of capitalism, quite often by people who just want to reform capitalism, right? 
So, you know, you've got various populist books that come out, you know, 24 things you want, you want to know about capitalism, so on and so forth. But actually, these are written by people who are talking about reforming it, not overthrowing it. But what you've seen more recently is, uh, in, like I say, the last 10 years, is a lot more radical literature, which is critical of capitalism, and young people who are disaffected by the whole system. So a whole generation coming up, right, between their 20s and 30s now, who are basically looking at insecure jobs, uh, being exploited, uh, poor pay, a polluted environment, uh, seeing things being destroyed around them. The, the future for them is worse than their parents and their grandparents. So their income, their insecurity, their jobs, their futures are all on the line. The system is failing them. So you, what you've got now is a, a younger generation who are seeing their lives looking worse. And as a result of that, there is really a political backlash. Now. So this is going in two directions, I would say. One is the very dangerous direction towards fascism. And we saw this in the 1930s. So when you get insecurity and failure of capitalism, what you do is you get an alliance between the capitalists and, and the extreme right authoritarian, because they don't mind, it's good for them. You know, capitalism can, capitalists can do very well out of an authoritarian system. But at the same time, this appeals to the populace because they offer security. And therefore, it's always somebody else's fault, the immigrants, the other, the Jews, the blacks, whoever it would be. So you know, the rise of things like Black Lives Matter, it's not a surprise this is happening because there are divisions in society that are being created purposefully about a hate society. So that's the right wing aspect of it you know, that's going on. So this aspect is there in terms of the way the system uh, is developing. But at the same time, you've got a revival of the left and the more radical and the, and the more extreme kind of forms of civil protest. So like Black Lives Matter, but also things like Extinction Rebellion or Fridays for the Future, whatever, which are basically critics, critics of, of the way that the neoliberalization of the environmental movement has occurred. So going back to civil protest and taking over the streets, which we haven't really seen since the 70s, you could say. And I suppose, particularly in the biodiversity area, particularly XR, is, uh, an area of XR has morphed into wild card, hasn't it? Uh, sort of demanding rewilding uh, of the royal estates yeah. um, and, uh, and so on. So, so the fact that they're getting defensive uh, um, suggests some at least positive movement in challenging, but uh, a sort of ongoing battle and tensions. And do you think, this is going to be more and more around land, food, biodiversity, because I suppose that used to be the basis for power, didn't it? Before energy came from carbon, you know, all power was built around controlling land. Yeah. So do you think as um, you know, carbon uh, energy becomes less of a crucial thing and survival and food living and so forth becomes more important, land is going to become again the source of power? Well, there's, I mean, resources are the core of this, right? So uh, land is definitely important, right? And, and, the, and you can see this, there is investment in land. This is also part of what these financial markets are about, is, uh, is actually making more money out of land, securing land, privatizing it, taking it over, getting, getting land out of public ownership and into private hands. Uh, this, a lot of this is, is on the move. So for sure, you know, and also the supply chains, though, but you've got to look at the complete supply chain. So, you know, the way that the, that the modern system developed was actually through long range transportation of food. So, you know, the United Kingdom massively dependent on North America for importing uh, wheat, you know, in the 1800s. And this was one way to maintain the growing population. So you get the growth of the British Empire, which is very much about trade and trading uh, you know, food produce and basics, basic staples. But we have a lot of other problems though now because we've got a much bigger population and we're dependent heavily on fossil fuels. So getting rid of fossil fuels is really not an option in terms of the way our current system is structured. So if we look at the economy, I talk about it as a social provisioning system. So how do we provide for the people in our society? Currently, the only way we can provide for them is with the fossil fuels due to the transportation and also the farming, the intensive farming. So what you're talking about is, you know, Britain is not, not independent. 
it is totally dependent on imports. The British population, you know, if you shut down the importation within 10 days, you'll have people rioting. There will be no food in the supermarkets. You know, it's, so places like Britain are really, uh, really susceptible to any change in the trade trade relations. But also, if you cut off the fossil fuels, what are you going to replace? How are you going to get your supplies in? But it's also then about how we supply things, the fossil fuel engines, you know, the kind of things that we've developed. They don't just require fossil fuels. They don't just require land. They require metals. They require all sorts of technologies you know, that have yeah. been built in. And the, the, the way that we've gone down the technological route means that there are a whole range of metals that are required, that are essential to maintaining the systems that have been set up. The like entire computerized system that is in you know, supply chains now requires you have computers. And that means that the computers require the resources. Look at China, right? The Chinese are very smart people. What has China done? China has infiltrated into Africa to secure major areas where there are resources that they know will be required and necessary for the future. So it's not just land. It's also essential resources that are being cornered. And, and that's the, the thing. So you've got the, then we have this very strong association of this type of economy with the military. And if you look at the correlation between gross domestic product, the size of an economy and the size of its military, there's a very straightforward correlation. So we have this going hand in hand with it. So fighting over land and the resources, but on an international basis for control and access, and also presumably for carbon sequestration. Yeah, it, it, I mean, this is also something that is kind of going on in the background, but no one is really taking carbon sequestration that seriously. If you look at the financial markets, they're just there to make money. They're not there to actually uh, to sequester the carbon. There's, there's no monitoring, there's no way that you can tell what's being sequestered and whether it is or not. And once you've got the piece of paper, then all they're concerned about is trading the piece of paper, not whether there's any real carbon being taken out of the atmosphere. But you could see like the, the, the ideas of uh, you know, taking over the Amazon or maintaining forests or whatever. I mean, there's studies going back maybe 30 years that show the, fallet, the fallacies of all of this. Just do the back of the end of calculations on how many trees you would need, what area of land you would need to cover. You know, it just doesn't work. So the, you know, you've got to stop the emissions from getting into the atmosphere in the first place. It's been known for a long time, but the revival of this idea that we're going to have uh, you know, nature-based solution, that nature is somehow gonna suck all the carbon out of the atmosphere, it, it's just fallacious but it's very useful if you want to just trade pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. So what's a, just as a final, what's, what's your final sort of, where do you see the positive, positive directions? Yeah, so I think that you've got to look at alternative systems, right? So what we've become aware of, and you know, I was trained as a mainstream economist, is you're trained to think there is only one economy, that there is only this capitalist economy or some form of it. And what actually what you learn over time is there are many types of economy and even within capitalism, there's many forms. And even within the capitalist system, there are different social relations. So, you know, how does a local community operate? It does not operate on the basis of monetary exchanges. It operates on trust, sharing, other institutions, uh, institutions of, you know, how do we use this piece of land? What do we do with it? How do we use the local park? And all sorts of relationships that we have. So what you learn is that there is a complex of relations. And those complex of relations mean there's alternative types of economy that we can have. So the positive side is to look at alternative forms of social provisioning systems and to start creating them and recreating them. Now, people have been doing this. And so there are many right, that still exist. So the farmers in India, for example, have a different type of economic system and they're actually fighting against the neoliberalization of their society. If you look in, you know, in South America, there are millions of people who live outside of the capitalist system and who are fighting against it and who don't want it. Now, these people are surviving in what we would have called a sustainable way. They have a different economic system. And, and so there, there are millions and millions of people, billions of people who are outside of the system already. And they are living in ways which we need to look at. But also there's people within our society, within our communities, you know, eco-villages are very small, experimental, 
but they are attempts to actually get a different type of social provisioning system operating, quite often totally against the odds, you know. So you get protest movements who set up things like the ZAD in France, which was a protest against an airport. They set up a whole social provisioning system, lasted 20 years. It wasn't encouraged by the government, it was destroyed by the military who come in with the police and destroy it and burn it down and bulldoze it. And so, you know, what we should be doing is encouraging diversity within the system, not being frightened about it, and actually encouraging people to live in alternative ways. So you see this, of course, in like, you know, attempts to do uh, transition towns or local exchange currencies or so on. These are experimental approaches around alternative social provisioning systems. They all have their pros and cons and we can investigate them, you know, but that's what alternative economics should be about, is looking into alternative ways of living living without money, you know, I, I see people seem to find this a ridiculous thing, but it's not ridiculous at all. You know, and I think that this is also very interesting. So starting to get serious research into alternative economic systems that operate in different ways. If I look at the history of the, you know, the rise of capitalism, for example, in, in, it rises in England, then you'll see the enclosure movement, which is talked about, is not enclosing a piece of land. It's about changing hundreds and hundreds of social relationships about the way that resources were used you know, and that the type of economy that you had there was built around all these institutional relationships in a village. Who could go to this field when? Who could take the gleanings out of the field? Who could collect wood from the local forest when? And there were so many rights. So to being a peasant gave you tremendous rights to use all sorts of resources in your local area, regulated, of course, under social institutions, the social norms of behavior. And the, these are the things that are eradicated by the rise of capitalism. It takes hundreds of years and actually ends up in the late 1700s with parliamentary acts to, to remove the rights from the peasants, from the copyholders, from the people who have rights to use various different resources. Uh, it's not this Garrett Hardin uh, awful uh, yes. you know, tragedy of the commons. The tragedy was Garrett Hardin, not the commons. Yeah. But, <laughs> That uh, whole story is totally fallacious because it's not about some piece of land uh, and some badly run commons. It's actually about a whole range of rights that had existed for almost a thousand years, uh, which are er er eroded through the rise of capitalism that have to be eroded to make things into markets. So relearn those. And actually, funny enough, where I live now uh, in uh, this village called Oddington, the last major event here was the protest against enclosures in the area. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much, Clive. That's been really uh, an amazing sort of coverage of uh, a whole range of fascinating issues. And um, thank you very much for giving us your time. Well, thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed it.